Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Let's get, uh, let's get ready to worship with a little bit of prayer, which is also worship, right? It's the best. All right, let's do it. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for bringing us together to worship you. And we, uh, we pray that that's our, um, on our minds and our hearts all the time, God, worshiping you, as we recognize that our calling is just that, God, to love you and worship you and honor you as king. So um, help us to uh, look no further than that, God, when we're struggling. We love you so much, and we just want to give you this time. Amen. Great is your faithfulness Great is your faithfulness You never change You never fail, oh God True are your promises, yeah True are your promises You never change Fellow guys, we raise up our hands, yeah. So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come, yeah. Yeah, we raise up holy hands to praise. your love and grace sing it out why what is your love and grace you never change you never fail oh god what is your love what is your love and To praise the Holy One Who was and is and is to come, yeah Yeah, we raise up holy hands To praise the Holy One Who was and is and is to come
You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace when my fear is crippling. You are hope, you are hope even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and you death has lost its sting. And oh, I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love Will always be enough Nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world forever reign And you are more you are more than my words could ever say You are Lord, you are Lord All creation will proclaim That you are here, you are here In your presence I made whole You are God, you are God Of all else to let it go And oh, I'm running I'm running to your arms The riches of your love Will always be enough Nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world forever rain on I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love Will always be compares to your embrace light of the world forever rain. my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever rain on. I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, cause nothing compares to your embrace. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Let's take this time just to greet each other now.
Good morning, Calvary Chapel, Roseville. How are we doing today? We got through the first slew of storms. Ready for the next ones? Lord, thank you for the rain, because we need it, right? All right, let's go through some of these announcements. If this is your first time here, we are delighted you're here. We'd love to get to know you a little better, and that's what these blue cards are for. You'll see them on the back of the seats here. And if you can fill them out, uh, and also they're good for one free item of your choice back at the Solid Rock Cafe. So there. Uh, if you haven't already, we'd love for you to follow us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, or Instagram. Uh, some of these announcements. Ladies, come join us this Thursday for a six-week video series of who or what defines you from the Calvary Chapel Modesto Women's Conference in 2016. We're meeting at the church here at 7 p.m., okay? So that's starting Thursday. Men's Bible study. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So we are in Micah, finishing up Micah, I think, or getting close to it. This Tuesday, men, if you are able, mentally, physically, all of the above, you should be there. It's a great time. So, communion tray off to my left. We, we, we move it back and forth to keep you guys on your feet, right? It's over here now. Uh, and that's if you, were, uh, if you would like to take communion before or after and don't want to wait for the once a month when we usually do it. It is available to you. Men's ministry, brothers, please pray for these upcoming events. We have a few coming up. Uh, Northern California, Calvary Chapel One Day Men's Conference. It's going to be in Sacramento. That's in May at some point. And then in October, that's a little far out, but uh, that's the Northern California Men's Retreat at Woodleaf. And then, as we mentioned before, every Tuesday we meet here. So uh, the Bible bus, you'll be traveling along in Matthew again this Wednesday. So don't miss that. Uh, let's see. Valentine's Day dinner. All couples and singles are welcome. Last day to sign up is approaching, so don't forget to sign up today for that. Uh, come share a catered dinner, music by our very own Wade, and uh, to have your uh, wedding vows renewed, if you so desire. So that is February 10th. That's a Friday. So I think that's about it. Uh, also a, a note in here to keep the inauguration here on January 20th in prayer because it can get pretty nasty out there. So, and pray for our nation. So if we can have the ushers come forward for this morning's offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time. I look around, and this is a motley crew, if you will. This is um, all of us who are just gathered here. We come from many different places and backgrounds, and we're just here because of you. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for this opportunity to bless you with our offerings. Uh, we know that you will use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I got the proverb today. And it's 23, 1 through 18. So if we want to turn to that. I'm going to begin. It goes like this. While dining with a ruler, pay attention to what is put before you. If you are a big eater, put a knife to your throat. Don't desire all the delicacies, for he might be trying to trick you. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears, for it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. Don't eat with people who are stingy. Don't desire their delicacies. They are always thinking about how much it costs. Eat and drink, they say, but they don't mean it. You will throw up what little you have eaten, and your compliments will be wasted. Don't waste your breath on fools, for they will despise the wisest advice. Don't cheat your neighbor by moving the ancient boundary markers. Don't take the land of defenseless orphans, for their redeemer is strong, he himself will bring their charges against you. Commit yourself to instruction. Listen carefully to words of knowledge. Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. My child, if your heart is wise, my own heart will rejoice. Everything in me will celebrate when you speak what is right. Don't envy sinners, but always continue to fear the Lord. You will be rewarded for this. Your hope will not be disappointed.
innocence of her own My sin washed away your blood Too much to make sense of it all I know that your love breaks my fall The skin don't grace You died in my place So I so will live Oh, to be like you Give all I have just to know you Jesus, there's no one beside you Forever the hope in my heart And death, where is your sting? Your power is as dead as my sin taught me to live in mercy my heart not to sing the day and its troubles shall come I know that your strength is enough a scandal of grace the scandal of grace you died in my place so my soul will live oh to be like all I have just to know you Jesus there's no one beside you forever the hope in my heart sing it it's all because and it's all because of you Jesus it's all because of you Jesus it's all because of your love that my soul will live Sing it again And it's all because of you Jesus, it's all Because of you, Jesus, it's all Because of your love that my soul Just 
Jesus, we, uh, we love you. Um, we're so thankful for your goodness and that we can, we can say that you alone are good, God. And I love what Maricela said about, um, about our humanity and how our, this life is not our own, God. Help us to remember that, that our, our only reason for being here, God, is to glorify you <laughs> and that hopefully other people can, can see you in us, God, through that example, Jesus. But help us to always remember, God, that this life is not our own, God, as we show others, God, what it's like to have you dwelling inside of us, God, and guiding our every step. We love you so much, and uh, we recognize that this morning in our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, young squire. <laughs> Praise God. Holy Spirit set up the perfect environment for today's message. Who doesn't have a bulletin? Okay. Ed Weathers does not have a bulletin, but Marie gave him hers. Anyone else? Who doesn't have a Bible? 
We need Bibles. These lights are a little too bright. Not, don't want to dim them too much or live stream will hurt, suffer from it, but a little too bright. Um, okay, everyone has a Bible. Everyone has a bulletin that you can open up and turn it into an image, an illustration. Amago, Amago actually, day is the proper pronunciation in the Latin. The image of God. This morning is what Sunday? Sanctity of Life Sunday. Thank you, Maricela, for your words, because those words just allow me to segue into the sanctity of life beautifully. Thank you. Lord, we come before you, and Father God, we thank you for life. We thank you for the sanctity of life. And Father God, I just pray this morning that we could open our hearts, open our minds, and Father, we would leave here with a new, deeper understanding etched upon our hearts, written upon our minds, and that our souls and spirits would just cry forth with this new understanding, this increased awareness of the sanctity of life from the biblical perspective, from the perspective of your eyes, Lord, that it be our perspective 100%, and we could drop all those things that our culture, our society, our prejudices, our biases produce the influences throughout a lifetime that are ungodly viewpoints of fellow man, and whether it be a fetus in the mother's womb, a child in the mother's womb yet to be born, or the elderly, Lord, and everything in between, Father God, that we could know that we know that we know all are sacred. Each and every single person on earth is sacred because you created us that way. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Now, hopefully, most churches are celebrating the sanctity of life this morning. That's my heart's hope. In this church, we're not the largest church on earth, that's for sure. No doubt about it. But we are a church with the heart of God. And as Maricela expressed, family. And we take that seriously here. We're here for one another. And that concept is a lost concept in our society. Whether it be at the place of work, where people are so quick to leave a, a, a job and the corpor corporation is so quick to let you go or to lay you off. And we know that now 18%, I saw this on the news the other night, 18% of Americans look at corporations favorably. The rest, the 88%, no, 82% look at corporations disfavorably. Why? Because the loyalty is not there. The sense of unity, the sense of family that many corporations once fostered is a rare deal in this day and age. Churches, churches, we have a lot of entertainment going on. We have a lot of, of social activities going on, a lot of, of social gospel reaching out to the poor. We do that. We have food bank every uh, Friday and Saturday, and we reach out, and those are good things. But the sense of family, of loyalty, and, and that's why I think military um, families are, have always excelled and, and just, just been incredible, because when you go through the military, you learn loyalty, you learn family, and those, stri those traits. And, and in time of war, it's, soldiers will say it's more about the buddies, it's more about your comrades in arm, arms, your brothers in arms, than it is about necessarily taking that hill or even taking that country. It's that camaraderie, that fellowship. And, and so too, it should be that way in a church. And, Certainly, in the church at large, we need to be a people who find life sacred, and we propagate that, and we, we just have that as something that we, we know that we know that we know. This morning, the message illustrated on the front of the flyer with a picture and a title, the title in Latin, Amago Dei, English translation, the image of God. If we can, is, is there any possibility of maybe 
holding that up to the camera somehow. I, I forgot to do that this morning so that those out there will know what we're talking about. If, there, if you could just maybe somehow, I don't know, I'll, I'll hold it up. But it's a picture of an elderly man, of a younger woman, and a, a man of, of ethnicity, a, a woman of ethnicity, and an infant, a young child. Uh, the, 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 the transitional stages of life, we all start off as a young infant in the mother's, first of all, in the mother's womb, then we are birthed, and then we grow into the different stages of life, and finally the last stage of elderliness, where we transist to heaven. And it's all part of the process, and it's all sacred. The different ethnicities that we see represented on this. Everyone is sacred. Amen? And this morning, we're going to unpack the fact that at the beginning of creation, God gave man the sacred duty to have dominion over planet Earth and to over, be an overseer of planet Earth, his creation. And when it comes to the sanctity of life, we know where we stand as a church. And I'm not going to preach to the choir this morning as I do year after year on this Sunday because you've heard me preach the basics of of why abortion is wrong and, and, um, and discrimination and, and those kind of things, why euthanasia is something that is very dangerous, a slippery slope indeed. And you've heard me preach these things year after year. Well, I want to come at it from a different angle this year. And when it, when it comes to sanctity of life, we do know the basics here. And I'm not going to spend the entire morning preaching to the choir Instead of repeating the obvious, which is obvious to believers in a church, evangelical church such as ours, I want to go deeper into the Word of God with the purpose of building on what we already know about the value that God Almighty has placed on every single human life. A given, from fetus to infant to child to young adult to adult to middle-aged to the elderly, all are precious in God's sight. This we know to be so. Amen? There's no group of people, there's no ethnicity, there's no economical strata or lack of strata that God would look on and favor less than another. That's God's truth. For you see, in God's economy, Every unborn child in a mother's womb matters. Every elderly life matters. Black lives matter. Police officers' lives matter. Every single life matters to God and therefore should to us as well. And we thank the Lord that we would cherish life and cherish each other. And we would do these things above all other activities we have in life. Last week, we went through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, loving each other, loving all people. Not loving sin, not condoning sin, mind you, but loving sinners as God loves us sinners. Amen? Please turn to me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. Genesis chapter, it's the first book in the Bible, and it's the first chapter in the Bible. It's not necessarily the first page in your Bible. You may have some other uh, index or, ma or whatever credits to the publisher, but it's the first chapter in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, and I'll read it to you. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing. Not things, but thing. That's not a typo. And beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, 
and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Now this, of course, was pre-Adam and Eve and the fall. Then God said, I, and this is of the utmost importance and interest, then God said, let us, not let me or I, one of the others correct English, but not, less, let, not let me or I, but let us make men in, not my, but in our image, according to our likeness. And so we find the plural of God, the Trinity. Let them, let the people, my creation, humankind, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all, and in the Hebrew the word means all, the earth, and, er and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That's a little creepy. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, here we find him commissioning his creation, he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Everything. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we're told, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, from the dirt, and breathed, breathed God's life, God's breath, into his nostrils, the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Most important. And then in Genesis 9, verse 6, we're told, For in the image of God he made man. It's on the screen. Okay, oh, Genesis 9, 6. I'm, I'm, okay, for in the image of God he made man. Verse, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 we find that we are a trinity in ourselves. The trinity of man, spirit, soul, and body. Those are the components of who we are. Now this morning, God's will is that the Holy Spirit would make a deposit, would impart into us an increased awareness and to each and every one of us. A knowledge and awareness that would penetrate our spirit and soul and body with an indelible, memorable, unforgettable knowledge that we would never lose sight of as we traverse, as we walk through life, and as we encounter many different human beings. Here we have a, a spectrum of variety, of different personalities, different societal positions, different intellectual levels of education and thought and whatnot, socioeconomic differences, just the spread of the spectrum. And it's all good. It's all part. It's all coming together at the foot of the cross, the leveling place, and knowing that we're all equal at the foot of the cross. And that one single human life is more valuable to God than the entire non-human creation. And we love the non-human creation. We love the mountains. We love the sea. We love the birds in the sky. We love our pets, the cats and the dogs that have learned over years to, to get our love. 
and their little floppy ways. We love the sunrise. We love the non-living creation as far as the non-human living creation. And because of that, he gave us his only begotten son, sent his only begotten son to earth, and that son took on bodily form, living here on earth, and he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for each and every single person. Mind you, get this, in God's eye, one single life is worth more to him than all the angels in heaven, the seraphim, the cherubim, all the stars in the sky and in the universe, all the planets, the black holes, the galaxies, all the mountains, rivers, and streams. You are worth more to God than all of them, Casey. Edgar, you are worth more to God than all of that. All of the animals combined. Every male, female, Jew, Christian, Gentile, Hindu, Muslim, Muslim, black, white, genius, intellectually challenged, gay or straight, fetus, infant, adult, elderly, sick or healthy, beautiful, homely, rich, poor, homeless or mansion dweller, educated, uneducated, prince or beggar, Democrat or Republican. Yes, I'm sorry to say, Democrat or Republican. God is not a Republican. God's kingdom is not going to be a democracy. It's a theology. It's a theocracy. Each and every single life matters. Each and every single life is worth more than all the gold, all the silver, and diamonds on earth and in the galaxies. You know, we're already trying to explore meteorites to harvest the, the gems, the whatever may be there, the, the metals and the, 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 the diamonds or whatever may be on those meteorites. Jesus died for all, and mind you, not all will receive him. In fact, most will reject him. That is fact. That is the parable of the sower. But he values each and every one of us because we don't know who has the potential to be saved. There was a time when I was not saved and no one, no one who was close to me ever thought, ever imagined I would become a Christian. One of my friends in Chicago, when she found out that I had become a Christian, she said, man, I got to check that out because... If he became a Christian, and, and I'm being told he changed, there's got to be something to that, if that's possible, if that took place. Another one said, oh, I could have maybe seen him be a Buddhist monk, but a Christian pastor? Are you kidding me? And so God comes into our life, and he changes us, and who, we know not who. He values each and every one of us, even before we came to him. Humans are the pinnacle, the peak of his creation. And the least of us is superior to the rest and best of creation. The very least one is superior to the best of the rest of creation. We are precious in his sight above all else, and we should be treating each other that way. Instead of getting caught up with the devil distracting us over the minors, it should be the majors, and this is the major. But what's the basis, the foundation for human superiority on earth, if you will? Some brainy scientist would tell you, hey, the answer to that question is simple, simpleton, dummy. Isn't it obvious? It's evolution. We crawled our way to the top of the evolutionary food chain. And now we do have dominion over everything. We have control over the animals. We use them for food, over the plants. We, we harvest them 
for food. And we play with science, we play with DNA and, and, and even the building blocks, the neutrons and the atoms. We, and more and more we do so. We have dominion all, over all the creatures and resources on earth. Sorry, but the Bible contradicts the theory of evolution. Yes, there's evolution of the species, but not evolution where some mud or some cells in mud end up being human beings. Even the scientists are beginning to have to face that fact that we came from somewhere and that there's a design to everything. The Bible tells us human beings are imago Dei, created in the image of God. Now note, not to say that everything else in the physical universe is not created and wonderfully made by God and, and often so beautiful, when I saw my first, our first daughter born, it was God. Cutting that umbilical cord, it was God. I couldn't, I could, I could only think, who could see such an event, such a miracle, and not believe in a designer and believe in God? Who, who, who could possibly? Well, there's a lot of people. But God created every neutron, every atom, and molecule, every galaxy and universe, and that 23% of, of everything that the scientists can't measure, can't see, they call it the invisible glue that holds everything together, black matter, he created that. And he holds it all together. And the creator, the master designer's fingerprints are all over the ocean, the rocks, the mountains, the streams, the flowers, animals, sky, stars, everything. And just like a human designer's hand is seen in a painting, in a fashionable garment that they created, a piece of art, a song, a watch or a car, well, so too, or even a scientific cure for cancer, well, so too, the things of God that he made have his fingerprints, and there is something that tells us a designer but they're not the same as human beings not even the angels for in us god's children is found the image of us of the father son and holy spirit and what separates us from even the angels is that god told man to be fruitful to multiply to fill the earth and subdue and rule the earth, and that we are his children. Angels can't multiply, they can't have children, and they will never rule the earth one day as we, God's children, one day in the new heaven and earth, we will rule the nations. That's read the book of Revelation. And these are qualities of being made in God's image. Angels and animals don't have those God-given attributes that we have, that we share with God. Hebrews chapter 5, I mean chapter 2, sorry, chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. He has not put the world in subjection to angels, but one day... We will have complete rule. In the garden, we had it, but then we lost it. And now we're in this period of time where it doesn't feel that way. Some build, take those two words, dominion, here in Genesis, and, and they, they build it up into dominion theology that the Christian church is to, that some say that we're in the millennium right now. And if we're in the millennial reign right now, I'm disappointed, to say the least. If this is it, dominion theology, that we're to take over every aspect of, of, of the world, the, the biz, all the businesses, all the governments, and, and on and on and on. Well, obviously that's not so at this time, but one day it will be so, because one day Jesus will return for the church, and one day he will destroy or 
just obliterate everything, and there'll be a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. And we will rule with him the nations of the earth. We will be in charge. And that's why we need to, to get it together on earth so that when we get to that place, we've got some kind of, you know, preparation. And this starts by being a king. We've been called king's kids. King's kids. President-elect Trump, his son Barron, is getting a little focus now. They're, they're saying, well, what's this kid, 10-year-old kid like? Well, he's like basically a king's kid. Well, we're king's kid, kids. God's king's. God is the king, and we are his children. And we should act accordingly. We should take that as a divine calling. I was going somewhere, but I can't remember where I was going. Oh, well, that happens. But there are qualities of being made in God's image that angels and animals don't have and that we do have. The image of God. What is an image? Well, an image is a representation. These aren't living people. These aren't real people on this piece of paper. They're a representation, though, of people in various stages of life, of various backgrounds and whatnot. A photograph is an image, a sculpture, a drawing, a likeness, a portrait of something else. And there are many images of something in this world, but humans are the only living image of God. We're not just an image. Some would say, well, God must look like man because Jesus came in the form of a man, and we were made by the Trinity in the image of, man, of God, and so we must look something like this. But well, we don't know. We have no way to know. One day we will. But we're living. We're the living image. And there's some depth there. There's some meaning there that goes beyond a typical image on earth. The Word of God makes it clear that there's a difference between us and everything else. We are the only triune living image of God. We consist of body, soul, and spirit, which is similar to God. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're the only part of creation that Jesus died a horrible death on the cross that we might join him in heaven and be freed from the penalty of sin. He didn't do that for the animals. He didn't do that for the plants. He didn't do that for the angels. We're God's children, his ambassadors. We represent him here on earth, the body of Christ. Literally, in that living image, we become his ambassadors, his servants, his stewards, his overseers here on earth, walking, I've said this before, walking and talking, reaching out with a helping hand, a hand to, to give and a hand to to pull those up who need to be pulled up, all those things. That's us, the body of Christ. That's who we are, king's kids, the children of God, the body of Christ, the living image of God, made by God in his image. There's a family of man, and the family of man is incredible, incredibly powerful at times, can be incredibly good at times, and can be incredibly evil at times. And so there is the family of man, but there's the family of God as well. And some of these things that we see here, that the family of man reflects God, reflects God, but doesn't have God in them. And at times, that reflection is powerful, but we're not just an image, a reflection, but an image that is living, breathing, and once born again, acting, upon, acting on God's behalf. The light that bounces off the moon, it hits the surface of the moon, 
and it bounces, it reflects, and we see it. It does light up the surface of the moon, but it's only that thick or less on that surface. But we see it, it's bright, and it lights up our night. But the moon doesn't contain the sun, S-U-N, that's shining upon it and that we see and that lights up that which is around us on a clear night at least. The sun is on the surface, but not inside the moon. And all humans have the opportunity to have the Son of God not only shining us, shining on us and reflecting off us, but as all humans to do to an extent, we do this, but we also have the opportunity to have God living in us when we receive Jesus into our lives and pouring out of us to all that's around us. It's called redemption and salvation and sanctification and walking in the way, walking in God's way. It's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's called the gifts of the Holy Spirit working through us. And what makes us different than the angels? Is it the ability to reason? Well, the angels reason to a certain extent. Is it to think and have emotions? Well, there's indication the angels I mean, have emotions. Is it personality that's unique to us? Well, you know, the angels have some personality. We see it in the Word when we, we see angels acting. Is it the ability to communicate with God. Well, the angels have communication with God. So what's the critical ingredient in the image of God in the Amago, Amago Day? Well, in Genesis 26, let us make man in our image and let them rule, have dominion over everything. Well, the angels aren't given that position on earth that we have. And yes, as I said, now presently our ability to rule and have dominion has been diminished, damaged, and curtailed by the fall, by sin, and the presence of sin. We're delivered from the penalty of sin. We're delivered from the wages of sin, eternal death. But we still live in the presence of sin. And we're still, still sinners. And one day that will not be. We will no longer, when we are with Jesus in heaven, we will no longer be in the presence of sin. But one day we will rule with him, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pastor, why should we study a text like Genesis chapter 1 on Sanctity of Life Sunday? Well, because we as Christians must learn to value human life the way the God of the universe does from a biblical foundation, from a biblical perspective. Not just using science to say, well, there's a fetus in, in the mother's womb, and, and now after all these years we can ultrasound and whatnot, and we can see or we can, we can scientifically prove that that fetus does react to pain and whatnot. But to have an understanding, a biblical understanding, that human life is sacred. One reason, because it mirrors God. We mirror God. God. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 18. God made us wonderfully. In our mother's womb, before the foundation of the world, however you want to, to look at it. And this was before we were saved, mind you. Each and every human has the potential to glorify and magnify God to mirror God because we're made in his image. However, the enemy is constantly trying to unravel that, to unmake that, to diminish, to hamper that from taking place, to black out the mirror, to even break the mirror, trying to get us to discount who we are, self-esteem issues, self-worth issues, self-value issues, 
not understanding who we are, if you know you're the king's kid, if you know you're a child of God, if you know you're called for the purpose, well, shouldn't you be walking straight and tall? Amen. But the enemy is the one that comes against us. And if we marginalize or minimize some, whether it be the unborn or the old, all become affected. In Nazi Germany, it wasn't limited. They didn't limit their genocide, their destruction to Jews. They also went after the mentally challenged and others. Anyone that they deemed to be unfit, they, they sought to destroy, to eliminate from the human gene pool, if you will. But God greatly values human life because it mirrors and expresses his essential qualities and characteristics. And this is a mirror the unsaved can reflect. An unsaved parent reflects this greatness as the way they treat their child. They love their child. They feed their child. They provide. They nurse. They care for their child. They protect their child. Because they are a mirror of God. And what does God do for his children? He feeds us. He takes care of us. He protects us. He provides. He, he loves us. He protects us like any father or mother would here on earth. And he puts that instinct into all to protect the children. He made his creation good. In chapter 13, we know love is not God, but God is love. God loves all. That's why he died on the cross for all. Not that all get saved. Not that all will accept that love and will take that grace into their lives and become part of the family of God, become part of his family of children. But it is there for the asking because he loves us beyond measure. And all we have to do is ask. And we receive his agape love and we can give out his agape love. His grace is for all, not all except. Human life mirrors God. But it goes deeper, and human, humans mirror the triune nature. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our, in, in verse 26 of Genesis 1, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of, in, of the air, and, and all multiply and be fruitful, fill the earth. And we have those plural pronouns in the Old Testament that are a picture, a reflection, a, a hint of what's in the New Testament, namely that God is one being but three persons making the Trinity. And this could never be the case with created beings. Yes, we can have body, soul, and spirit, but we are not three people. Yes, I can be a father, I can be a son, I can be a husband, but I'm not going to be three separate people. If I say I'm three separate people, some people are going to be questioning my well-being, my mental health. And we have the account in Matthew 3, 16, 17, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan. At that moment, the Trinity was present. The voice of the Father was heard from heaven. Jesus the Son was being baptized. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. And so, do we, human beings, have these three aspects to us? May your soul, may your spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord. Now, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the, now the Christ. The Greek words used here are pneuma, for spirit from which we get terms like pneumatic, suki for soul, which we get the word psyche, and soma, for which when combined with psyche, we get psychosomatic. But the bottom line is this, that though we do not want to be dogmatic about the way in which we say that we mirror the triune nature of God, nevertheless, in some wonderful way, we humans 
do indeed reflect that nature. And that puts us in a class of our own. And so we are mirrors of God. In Genesis 9, 2, the fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground. In Genesis 9, 2, and upon all the fish of the sea that are given into your hands. And so we have a sober, solemn, sacred duty to all that's out there. And that's why we, we pause and, and we do our best not to wipe out different whales or even different squirrels or toads and whatnot. We don't want to wipe out species. And we do care. Our society is built on murder is bad because we have this, this responsibility. Human life is sacred because it not only mirrors, but it magnifies God. We are God's masterpiece. We are most vividly reminded of this in the incarnation of the Son of God. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. We magnify God. When the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman. And John puts it this way in John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And so we magnify God because he chose to be like us. Chose to be like his creation when he made us in his image. In verse 27 in Genesis, notice the repetition in the verse. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. We were created to have communion with God. And yes, to a significant part, we lost that when Adam fell into sin. But the word says it will be restored with the last Adam, with Jesus Christ, and has been for the believer. In Romans 5.19, Paul said, for just as through the disobedience of one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, Christ, the many will be made righteous. This morning, have we been made righteous? Good. I like that. There was, you know, it wasn't, yes. There was, you know, because you've been taught. And you know. You know we've been made righteous. How? Oh. By the blood of Christ, we've been made righteous. We have his righteousness. It may not feel like that because we, you know, we know that we have our, right, we, our lack of righteousness, but we stand on his righteousness. Human life is sacred because it magnifies God. The miracle of the human life and its complexities and giftings and remarkability, its abilities that God has given us, they magnify God. Human life is sacred because it mirrors God. Human life is sacred because it magnifies God. And finally, and most of all, human life is sacred because it manifests God. In verse 28, the creation of man more than any other part of God's work, and it's incredible. We have these telescopes, the Hubble, and now we have another one that's like 10 times better than the Hubble that they say will be able to look into the beginning of the universe will be able to see exactly what took place when the universe began. Of course, they won't be able to fully explain it. They'll be able to say, well, here, here's the, the video of it. But how it took place, I mean, they'll see, okay, well, hey, there was a Big Bang or whatever, an expansion or whatever, but, but they're not going to be able to say, okay, but here's, here's God and his hand pointing and making it, here's God speaking it into existence, that part they're not going to be able to give us. And that's what, how it's always going to be. But human life is sacred because it manifests God. The creation of man, more than any other part of his work, shows forth in mad, majestic splendor. It shows his qualities and his characteristics. David said this in Psalm chapter 8, Verses 3 through 5. This is King David of Israel speaking. 
When I consider he's before God, he's humbled. He's before God as creator. And he says to God, when I consider your heavens, don't forget they didn't have the science we have, but when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? In all this splendor, in all this grandeur, in all the universe, and now we know more than David knew, what is man that you even care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. The ultimate proof of the manifestation of God in man is found in the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, in verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 should do it. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in many various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. And it's Jesus that appoints us heirs. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation, the exact representation of the Father's being to a T. And we are the representation and manifestation of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here on earth. Human life is sacred because it mirrors mirrors God, it magnifies God, and it manifests God. God is seen in our enjoyment of creation. You've heard me say it before. You know, I, maybe I could possibly entertain the evolutionists and their theory. It's just a theory, by the way. They call it the theory. It's not proven. It's a theory. And I'll, you've heard me say before, if it weren't for color, if everything were in black and white, the flowers, the birds, the sky, the ocean, if it were all in black and white, monotone, well, then maybe I might say, well, you know, this may be some kind of mechanical, even biological mechanical evolution that took place. But colors, the colors speak. They scream out. They cry out. This is for your enjoyment. This is for you to appreciate, to look and say, wow, look at that bird. Look at that sky, that sunset, that sunrise. Look at the colors of the ocean. It's for us to enjoy. It's built into his creation. God richly provides in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Acts 14, 17, he's shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. I, I love that food part, being a calorie chapel pastor. In Psalm 4, 7, you have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. What is the, the chief end of man? Well, man's chief end, purpose, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And in heaven, we will enjoy him. We'll be with him, and we'll be praising him, living with him, enjoying him for eternity. And human life manifests God in its ability, its capability to enjoy. And not only enjoy, but influence. Bring that joy to others, to share it. Saving endangered species, saving the fetus of the child in the womb. You've heard it said because we are, I'm speaking to the choir, we've said people out there, the world spends more time saving a toad or, or, or the whale or the trees than 
human beings in the womb. And there's truth to that. Treating the elderly. I see this happening where the elderly are being diminished. Yesterday, a sister told me she's, she works in, in the hospice system with the elderly. And she told me, and she said, this is not by any means the general opinion of hospice workers. Only one man said this to me. And she told the man, hey, I'm wearing a, a, a filter mask so that because I have a cold and I don't want to give a cold to any of the patients that they might get a cold and get pneumonia or something. And the man said to her, oh, don't worry about it. Pneumonia is the elderly's friend. Yeah. Now, you know what? That doesn't surprise me. I spend a lot of time with doctors and nurses and in the hospital. And, and what I see is I see this general deal, and then it's an unspoken. But when you get to a certain age, then it's like, well, you know, what, is you, do you have a directive? And they're, they're just, you know, it, they treat you a little different than when you're young. The sanctity of life doesn't end at middle age. The sanctity of life is from birth, actually from in the womb, all the way through the different stages of life. It needs to be respected. It's all part of God's plan. Treating, with, treating elderly with the respect they deserve. Treating all people with respect. When I was in Lisbon, Portugal, at that time, people in Europe dressed very well all the time. And Americans were introducing jeans and, and casualness into Europe. And the Europeans did not get it. They did not understand it. And I said to a, a woman in a, in a hotel lobby, I, because she said to me, well, why do you Americans wear jeans? You know, that's for, like, working. And why do you look so casual? You, why, you know, you have money, you have education, you come from the greatest nation on earth, America, and, and why? And I said, well, we just don't really, you know, see a reason why we have to dress up all the time. And I turned it on her and I said, well, why do you Europeans think you have to be dressed well all the time? And she said, well, you know what? It's out of respect for God and God's creation. God chose us to be special in the universe. And we don't want to act like animals. We don't want to dress like animals. And that's why, and, you know, I was, whoa, I didn't even have any, a comeback. And of course, I wasn't a Christian. But, you know, looking back on it, I understood what she was saying. The sanctity of life. Because human life manifests God. We ought to hold it up high, even as the Lord does, protecting, defending the innocent and the helpless, and esteeming us high in his universe, beloved, valuable. And that's each and every one of you. If you don't feel that way, you need to get right with God because your thinking is wrong. You know what? We all have problems. Every person I know close acts crazy from time to time. I'm not kidding. It's just the human condition that God loves us. The sanctity of life is something that we as Christians must take seriously and defend very rigorously. The pagans in our midst see human life as little better than animal life or plant life. To them, people are disposable, cheap, worthless. Oh, Africa, you know, all oh, the Africans, they, you know, they just kill each other. They, they you know, they, they, they die all the time. They get wiped out. Uganda, Rwanda, you know, they, they just do that to each other. And, and But, you know, it, it's not like if it were happening here because we're different here. We value. No. A mother having her son taken from her in Africa hurts just as much as it does here.
corporations treating people as they're disposable, a dime a dozen, marginalizing different groups. To the rich, the poor become invisible servants. They go to their offices and uh, with the window, the, you know, the office with the window and whatnot, and as they walk, they don't see the cleaning person. They just walk by them. Or the cafeteria, they're talking to each other as the, the cafeteria worker's putting the food out, never even saying a thank you part of the time. Not everyone's like that. I'm just saying, think about it. In Genesis 9, 6, We read these words, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God has God made man. This includes the human fetus, the unborn child, the person that transitioned from earth time. On this Sanctity of Life Sunday, let us recommit ourselves to the reverence for human life that is so tightly bound to these verses that first teach us that man was created in the image of God. And those that take innocent human life are guilty of a sin that is deserving death. Genesis 9, 6. Now what can we do to make a difference? I always like to have the practical. Well, we can stand against abortion and genocide and, and looking down on people, people groups. We can have people in our fellowship who minister to the elderly We can care. We can vote responsibly, exercising dominion that God has put within our grasp to vote in who we want, who, who has values that are more in line with ours. We can reach out to help people. Abortion, you know, we can get out there and hold up plaques in front of the abortion center. We can do that. But you know what else we can do? We can change. Oh, God hates murderers. Or you know, or, or you're going to go to hell. We, we can put up there, hey, take a child in. We can have a, a sign that says, free diapers here. Another sign that says, free cribs here. Free food here. Free adoption here. That's the signs that we need to have. Because we are the body of Christ. Amen? Human life is sacred because it mirrors God, because it magnifies God, and because it manifests God. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this day. And Father, I would pray that we would let our minds just flow right now. And we would think of who it is in our life that we've minimized. Is, the person, is it the person that serves us at the restaurant, the waiter, who we don't even say hello to or ignore? Is it some particular group of sinners, Wall Street, greedy Wall Street? Is it the Hollywood crowd? And I know I'm guilty. I say Holly weird and Holly weed and those things. And and Lord, but yet when we were in Hollywood and we had a church and we ministered to Hollywood stars and producers and writers and whatnot, they were some of the most incredible Christians. They were awesome. And they influenced their world because they had money and they had power and influence and they used it in a Christian way to change things. And Lord, whoever it might be, if it's someone, if we have if we have prejudices, ethnic prejudices against, some, against a particular race or even religion, Father God, yes, we want to lead them, too, into the kingdom, no matter who they are. But whatever pops into our mind, maybe it's developmentally challenged people, whoever it might be, Lord, let us from now on see them. If we are treating women disparagingly, that we're turning them into objects in our society, let us know that, those, that each and every woman is someone's child, someone's daughter, and Father God, your daughter. And let us not look upon 
in the wrong way, your daughters. And Lord, we just come to stay and we ask that you would change us and help us and direct us, Lord. Knowing that we are made in the image of God and that we would respect life here on earth. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you don't know Jesus, come on up and talk with me after service or talk to someone you came with or talk to anyone here because practically everyone here can tell you about Jesus. If you need prayer, if you want to confess maybe you've been a bigot or you've been whatever, come on up and I'll pray with you or pray with someone you came with or someone, just pick anyone out. Lord, thank you for this day and this people. Amen.